Jaina, welcome everyone to our Wednesday night session. I'm going to open up with the Lord's Prayer in the ancient Aramaic tongue, the language of Jesus. He did not speak Hebrew. He spoke Lishana Aramaya, the Aramaic tongue. So I'm going to say that prayer now in his language. Shall we pray? Aun dosh me yanet kadesh shmach tete malkuthach nehwe sewi ana ke kanada shme ya apar a haulan lach mesum kananya mana washwoklan hau ben e kanada hanan shwakin la hayuen la tatensiona ella pasen min bisha methol de lach malkutha Haila Tishbohta La Alam Almin. Amen. All right, don't forget to write your questions down and put it in the chat, not in the chat, I'm sorry, in the QA. And I'll be glad to answer your questions. Tonight, I'm still going to continue with what I started with last Wednesday. And that was on being God's sons. Just as a brief review, in case we have some people who didn't make the class last Wednesday, I'm going to give you the scripture here. I'm going to be reading from John. And I'm going to go back a little bit before we get to the 12th verse, where it says, he was in the world and the world was under his power or was in existence, and yet the world knew him not. We're talking about the Miltha, but the Miltha was in Jesus, and Jesus was in the world and didn't was not recognized. The world knew him not. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But the point is, why Why couldn't the world and why couldn't his own receive him? I'll tell you why. And people still have that problem today. <laughs> it's because spirit enfleshed itself. Spirit incarnated. That is expressed through Jesus. But he was flesh and blood and spoke Aramaic and was like everyone else. He was a little boy in the streets. He did all everything else that every other little boy did at that time in Israel. And, and especially in Galilee in the north. And yet, it's when he became a man and started speaking, they knew him. Even when they saw him, they said, oh, we know who you are. You're, you're the son of Mary, because at that time, his father had passed on. And that's why they said, you are the son of Mary. All that they couldn't recognize him because he, he grew up with them. He, and then all of a sudden, he's... God's son, the expression of God, couldn't recognize it because it was coming through the human being. Okay, but but those who did receive him, this is what I really enlarged on last week. But those who did receive him, to them he gave Lambda translated. I'm reading from the from the Lambda translation here. He gave them the Lambda translated as power, but the word there is shultana, which means the right, the absolute right. That's what it means. And more than just power in the sense of energy, but here it means the the right, the authority to for what? To be, or Lambda translated, to become, either way is correct to be or become sons of God. In other words, to act out your sonship. You can call yourself a son of God, a daughter of God. And I explained the reason why we use sons and why we use those. It's, it's a coverall term in the ancient language, meaning all the children of the father. So here... It says, especially those who believe in his name. And I explained that too. It means to believe in what he said and what he taught. 
That's what it means to believe in his name, in his way, in his method, what he taught us. Okay, I'm, I'm only just slightly going over that because of where I'm heading to. Then I closed with Romans, the eighth chapter and the 19th verse, where it says, for the earnest expectation, Dr. Lambs had translated that way, for the earnest expectation of all mankind, is the way Lamza has it, but the word there is breathe, that which means creation. All living beings are waiting for, then Dr. Lambs had translated for the manifestation, which is fine, nothing wrong with that way of translating it. The word there in Aramaic is Gilyana, and Gilyana means you uncovered something, you pulled back the curtains, uh -huh. you unveiled it. You know, like you're getting ready to see a play, everything is hidden behind that curtain. And all of a sudden, the curtains are drawn back or they are lifted up and then everything is exposed. And so they're saying that the earnest expectation, the yearning of, of everyone, of all creation, that's the word that's used there, or humankind or living beings, wait for the unveiling of the sons of God. Okay, and this is where I want to take it now uh, with that expression. Waiting, what are we expecting? What are we waiting for? You'll find that most Christians today, and by the way, <laughs> I'm going to say something. I said it's Sunday in, the, in a church, but I'm going to say it again tonight here because I didn't do it last week. He didn't say, <clears throat> but those who received them, to them gave he the right or the power, the authority to be Christians. <laughs> Uh-oh, that's going to get me in trouble. Because everyone uses that term. Christians, what would we do without the word Christian? And I told, told you the last time how we even got that title. It wasn't given by the church. It wasn't given by the people who were following Jesus' teaching. It was given by the people in Syria. And there in Syria, because of the movement was gathering so many people, uh, and it was in the city of Antioch, is where they were, the city of Antioch, and they call them Christians, means the followers of the Christ. And that's how we got the title Christians. But Jesus didn't come to make us Christians. <laughs> uh oh, what I just read it to you right from the Gospel of John itself. People can get mad at me if you if you like, but it says, "But what to manifest something to manifest that we are sons of God, and all creation, humankind, everyone's waiting for the manifestation for the unveiling of these sons. We are here now." Hmm? for the sunset i'm going to go to another scripture here i turned my scriptures over so fast i lost the place i was in okay i'm going to go to john first john the epistle to first john i, I love this the epistle of first john the third chapter okay all right, what are we waiting on? I tell you what most Christians are waiting on. They're waiting on Jesus to come back and do something that he didn't do the first time. In other words, what he did the first time was insufficient because they keep waiting for him to come back and return and slay our enemies and take care of everyone You know that is against us. That's not how Jesus taught his gospel. And we misunderstand it greatly and we're waiting on jesus when humankind is not waiting on the son of god to be unveiled he was unveiled and they cru crucified him because they didn't recognize him they didn't recognize the ishidaya ishidaya means the soul heir the beloved son the firstborn boy so Jesus was to be the firstborn of a whole new flow of the sons of God. <laughs> that, 
I know you never hear this because they don't preach it, even though the Bible says it. They just don't preach it at all. They don't declare it. They don't make it known. Jesus was the son of God, and he came to awaken our sonship with God so that he because he was the firstborn boy. That's why the term only begotten in that very first chapter, which I already read to you uh, in, in the 14th verse. It's always translated the only begotten son. That eliminated us completely. <laughs> it's, it's not so, and the word begotten is not there at all. It's not there in Greek and it's not there in Aramaic. It's only one word in Aramaic, Ishidaya, and that word simply means the firstborn male in a human Near Eastern family. That's what it means. But here, when John is using it, he's showing it that Jesus is now the he's using that illustration of a family and the firstborn boy who is the Hedaya now becomes the pivotal heir of everything for all the sons that would follow after him, all the children that would follow after him, all the daughters and sons of God term Christians wasn't even in existence. And even the term Christ wasn't even in existence. It was the term Mashiach or Mashiach. Mashiach is Hebrew. Mashiach is Aramaic. Same word. They just reversed the ending of it. That's all. And means the anointed one, the Messiah, the Mashiach. So, but he didn't come to make Christians. And his last name isn't Christ. That's only a title. And that's from Greek. That definitely comes from Greek. But he is the firstborn boy. Not only begotten. Terrible mistake. I mean, I wish Jerome had not done that in the fourth century. But he did. And that everyone translates it. Even when you look it up in the Aramaic dictionary and you look up the word Ehidiah, it'll say begotten. And that man who did that uh, knows that the word begotten is not there. And it doesn't mean only begotten. It means the firstborn boy. And, and it's used spiritually. So son of God means God-like. God-like expressing expressing the goodness of God, which is love and peace and joy and harmony and understanding and enlightenment and patience and all this. And we call it love, but God is love. That's what God is. Okay. Got that clear. Now, I'm going to tell you one other thing, what it means when we say son of God. I told you it, it refers to our relationship with God because we are in the flesh, just as Jesus was in the flesh. But now he's totally spirit, completely spirit, no more flesh. And he's not going to come back flesh. He's always been here in spirit. And everyone who has made a transition is always in spirit. They're there. And but because of what he left, he said, the spirit of truth, which means my influence on you, what I taught you. This is when he, Jesus was speaking to his disciples. And he says, I will send you the paracleta, which is my influence, what I have taught you, the spirit. So it's your relationship, is your sonship, your relationship with God. And it has to be living, real, vibrant, and expressive. Didn't use the term Christian. So as I told you, that came later in Antioch in Syria. So, and today, that's all it is. Oh, are you a good Christian? Are you? <laughs> That's not it. It's how are you treating yourself and how are you treating other people? That's what you're a son of God. You treat them the way God would treat them. Of course, if you have a judging God, well, then you, you will be a judgmental. But this is not what Jesus said. So what? It, how are we the son of God? How? Okay. Allah ruha. What did I just say? Halacha Ruhao. 
I just said in Aramaic, Allah, which is God, Ruhau. So I shortened the word Ruha and said Ruhau, which is Ruhau. God, spirit is. In other words, God is spirit. That's what I said. So God is spirit. His sons also are spirit. Plain and simple. It's your spirit that is your sonship. And the flesh is only is only a covering of the spirit. That's all. And when you lose the flesh, spirit is totally released. Okay? Now, I just wanted to make that clear. Allah, Ruhau, God is spirit. Therefore, the sons of God are also spirit. That's where our, that's where our sonship lies, even though we have a human body now. Now I'm going to First John, third chapter, and I love the way John puts it here. It's so beautiful. He says, "See how abundant." Lance translates that word "sagi." That's the Aramaic word there, which means a lot of. <laughs> it means a great deal of sagi, so much. Oh, <laughs> see how abundant. Now he 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 does it literally the way it's written in the Aramaic. Uh, see how the love of God, and then then the word abundant appears. Sagi. That's how it is there. The love of the Father it doesn't say God. He says. The Father. And literally, how I would translate it is see how abundant the Father's love is toward us. And that word toward is loatan, toward us, because you're saying it's coming towards us. Loatan. We read that in the first chapter of John, in the first verse, that the Milta was with God or toward God, or in the presence of God, so it's the word loat. but when you say toward us, or with us, we would say uh, loatan, T-A-N, loatan, toward us, for he has made, now Lambda says, he has called us sons and made us. Uh, I, I would do it for the English sake, I would say, for he, meaning the Father, has called and made us sons. Called us as sons, made us as sons. I would put it all before rather than he has it exactly the way it, it's done in the Aramaic. And that's why it gets a little uh, confusing. It, he has, for he has called us and made us. But, it, but he, has, he has called and made us sons. Sons should come last. So, I, I love the way John puts that. Can you imagine being called the son of God? Can you imagine going to church one day and sitting in there and everyone, all the ministers addressing you or whoever is in charge addressing you? All right, congregations of the sons of God. That's what you are. Uh, again, people would pass out on that <laughs> because the term Christians have taken over. And congregants, the word con congregants have turned as was what we would use. But no, they're sons to be sons of God. Therefore, now, is what he's going to say here? He's going to say something about us who are sons of God. The same thing he said about Jesus in the first chapter of John. That's why I read those first verses again of 10, 11, and 12. He says, the next thing he says Therefore, the world does not know us. The world does not know us because it did not know him. Didn't know him when he was in the flesh. How is it supposed to, as the son of God, how is it going to know us? Didn't know him, won't know us. <laughs> I just love the way he put that. He said, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Fooled by the flesh. 
by the human, by the body. Then he goes on to say, my beloved, Habibe, that's how you say my beloved in Aramaic, Habibe, my beloved. Now, right now, at this moment, and that word for now in Aramaic is hasha, hasha, now, are we the sons of God? Right now, even though it's in this flesh, we are. But right now, we're, we are the sons of God. <laughs> it's hard to take, isn't it? But this is what Jesus came to do. Not make Christians, but make children of God. Because God wants a human family. He made us in his image and likeness from the very beginning. But they departed from it. They lost it. They buried it. They eclipsed it. Who did? Humanity. And even in a sense, we've done that even in Christianity. Because we made the emphasis on sin. We put the total 100% emphasis on sin. Yes, we do sin. Yes, we do make mistakes. Yes, we do horrible things. We do disastrous things. We hurt. We kill. We do all kinds of things. That's because we eclipsed our sonship with our stupidity and ignorance. That's why. And humanity has done that. And even when we mention God now, we don't see God as spirit. We have all these things. That, look at the church buildings. Look at the ancient church buildings. Look at even the church buildings. And when you go to France, or when you go to Italy, or when you go to all these other places, I, I've been on tour in all those places and been to all those churches. They're magnificent. They are beautiful, but they're all stone. They're all stone. And, and then you may burn incense. You may make the whole place filled with incense and do all kinds of things. Oh, I smell God incense. No. Oh, I feel the holiness. No. Do you feel the holiness in your flesh? Do you? No, you have to have all these outward things. Burn candles, burn incense, burn all that. But to recognize it in your flesh, in your body? Well, we don't because we've been, we've eclipsed the God in your temple. In fact, that's what I'm going to be getting into in the next session when we do the Gospel of John. Because in the Gospel of John, Jesus talks about that. And I will go into that more. I don't want to go into that tonight. But when we do the next Gospel of John, the next chapter, I I will be doing that for you in uh, in the month of June, in the second Saturday in June. Okay. So he says, but, we, but now he's going to tell us something fantastic here. Now are we the sons of God? Yes, we have this holiness now. You your whole being is filled with holiness. And then he goes on to say, and as yet, and as yet, it has not been revealed, that is, unveiled, uncovered, manifested. In other words, there's something more, even though we have it in the flesh now, and by doing and expressing love and compassion and all the things that really show that we're children of God, that we're sons of God, what? What we, sh it has not been revealed what we shall be because we're not totally spirit. We're flesh. We're human. But we know, oh, listen to that. But we know that when he shall appear. That is, when we get to see him in his full spiritual being, as some of the early church got to see, the early, I shouldn't say church, the early followers of Jesus got to see him. They got to see him. They saw his glory. But he was spirit. But they were seeing an image. But the spirit, they got to see the glory of his spirit. That's why they, they had faith in the resurrection. They saw it. 
for we shall see him as he is. In other words, we will be like him fully. We will be like him as full spirit. Right now, it says, became flesh. Spirit became flesh. That is, the milta enfleshed itself. And still is doing that and has always done that. This is what happened. That's why people feel such a change and they call it born again. But the born again wasn't the idea of, of you uh, being saved. The born again experience in the scriptures refers to your eyes get open and you see the kingdom of God here and now and you see your role in it. That's the meaning of the born again experience in John the third chapter. Again, I'm not going to get into that now. But that's what it is. Your sonship is your spirit. Okay? So realize that. You have that. And I love that. In First John, you need to write it down and go read it. I love the way Dr. Lambs had translated it here, even though I made reverse some of the English, but it was strictly English. Again, I'm going to read the whole thing and let it sink in. Let it become a part of you. Feel the energy of it. Feel that movement of spirit within your own heart and soul right now. It's love. It's peace. It's joy. It's not a know-it-all. It's a peace, a joy. Hmm? See how abundant the Father's love is toward us. For he has called and made us sons. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Oh, my beloved, now we are the sons of God. Think about that. Now are we the sons of God. And yet, it has not been revealed what we shall be. <laughs> wow. There's more of us yet to be unveiled. Although everyone is waiting for the manifestation of sonship in wherever you are. We think a son, you have to be a minister or you have to do. No, 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 no. On your job, be a son of God. In your household, be a son of God. Among your relatives, be a son of God. Let love, let joy. Don't try to preach to them. They won't hear it anyway. <laughs> what you have to do is just let that joy come. Let that peace come. And when there's a big quarrel, then, you know, settle it. Settle it. Hmm? Don't try to convert them to anything. They, they can only be done. This is why people were impressed with Jesus. Because he expressed it. He didn't go around calling people sinners and you got to accept me as your savior or you won't get anywhere. You'll go to hell. No, he never taught that kind of stuff. It's made up by the churches because they misunderstand the, 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 the scriptures themselves. They misunderstand and I understand why they misunderstand. This is why I'm in this doing this to express to you the real essence and joy that is that the scriptures do give us and not the pain and guilt and everything else that we get from misunderstanding scriptures. We misunderstand so much because we misunderstand Eastern ways of speaking and the cultural use of words. And that's what made Dr. Lanza so fantastic when he translated the entire Bible from Semitic language and, he, and, and with the commentaries here, that I redid and added more in it that we did together, but he, he did the major ones in the beginning and I kept them, but straightened out certain things, but they're all there, all the customs and everything. So you can see it in a new light. You know, take for instance, the word heaven. We only think one thing, heaven oh, up there. Yeah, the sky, past the sky, heaven, heaven. But the use of the word heaven in the Bible has many, many different meanings. When Jesus was baptized by John, it says the heavens opened. 
That is a idiomatic expression. That's what it means when it says the heavens were open. The heavens didn't, the sky didn't split or the clouds didn't move one way and the other cloud moved the other way to open up the heavens. <clears throat> it's an Aramaic way of speaking, meaning a revelation came on them. And basically on Jesus. Possibly John saw it too. But I, I'm doubting it. Otherwise, and the reason why I doubt it is because John wondered if Jesus was the Messiah and he sent his disciples out to Jesus say, are you the one or do we expect someone else? Had it seen that vision, that was Jesus who saw it and expressed it and that's why they wrote. It. So heaven opened means that a revelation is occurring. And it's also again at the end of the first chapter of the gospel of John in the 51st verse. And he said to them, this is Jesus speaking to the few of the disciples he had gathered around him. And he said to them, Amen, Amen. I say to all of you that from now on, you will see the heavens opened, which means you're going to hear revelations. You're going to understand God in a new way. You're going to understand heaven in a new way. This is, this is all Aramaic way of speaking. Heavens literally didn't open when he told his disciples this, but he said something else. He added, not only the heavens are open, why are they open? So that the angels of God, you will see the angels of God ascending and descending to this human being, or it says son of man. In other words, to this fleshy being, you're going to hear messages from God. Angels ascending and descending means messages coming forward and messages going back, messages going out. That's angels ascending and descending. You're going to hear peaceful, loving teachings when they ascend and descend. When angels, messengers have perfect access, going and coming, going and coming, meaning you're going to hear such teachings that will put you at peace. <laughs> Remember that one of the patriarchs had a dream like that. It was Jacob who was fleeing from his twin brother who was about ready to fix him really good. And Rebecca helped him flee all the way going back up into Aram, Padan Aram, to be with her, her brother Laban, which would be Jacob's would be Jacob's uh, uncle. So, and he had a dream before he went there. He saw angels ascending, ascending and descending. We translate it as ladder, but it means steps. It means coming from the temple on high and the, and the stairs, the stairs. Angels ascending, uh, ascending up and descending down, which means you will return back to the land that you're fleeing from and you will know peace and joy. So this is what Jesus was telling them, telling them the same thing. And, and, and but only he used an expression. This wasn't a dream. He actually used this expression that heavens are open and you'll see the angels ascending and descending. Figures of speech, figures of speech. They never saw one angel coming or going, but they heard them. And they heard them through the teachings of Jesus, what came from him. This is, this is the use of the term heaven. Mm -hmm. You have to understand how it is used. One other place where it's terribly misunderstood is in Paul's letter to the Galatians. When he wrote to the Galatians, he told them to be wary of these angels from heaven that come with another gospel. Angels from heaven means that the term heaven there means with special revelation. And they are messengers. In other words, false teachers, false ministers who are teaching you another gospel instead of the simple, which is Jesus' gospel, the simple gospel of love and peace and joy and harmony and understanding and enlightenment. This is, this is, this is what he taught. It's simple, simple. But oh, have we made it complicated? And we think, oh, we got to be careful that 
an angel comes to you preaching another gospel, thinking an invisible angel in the sky, because ministers and teachers were called angels. That's what they said. And even Paul in another letter says to them, don't you know that you're going to judge angels? <laughs> yeah. Judging angels means judging the speakers that you hear. You're going to judge them. Are they? Because you know the simple truth of the gospel of Jesus, and you will be able to judge what they're saying. Are they giving you something way out in left field, or are they giving you direct understanding that you know about the simplicity of the teachings of Jesus? Ah, yeah, how we read the Bible is utterly amazing. This is why we have so, so much misunderstanding, so much guilt, so much judgment, so much, and when we make God a punitive God, we make, oh, oh, and I even have something here that someone sent that it just, I won't even read it to you. It's that bad. And it's paragraph after paragraph after paragraph and talking about how God needs blood in order to forgive us. And uh, it, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous because they don't understand Near Eastern culture. Remember, this spiritual revelation, heaven comes to us from the Near East. I'm talking about a revelation. Heaven comes to us from the Near East. Mm -hmm. And you have to understand that when they spoke it, it was spoken in that Near Eastern language. I don't care whether it's Hebrew or Aramaic. It makes no difference. It's a Semitic language. And they thought differently, pictured differently, and lived a culture differently than we do today. But when we took it and we read it, we read it with Western glasses. We read it with Sunday school glasses. We read it with theological glasses. We read it with all kinds of stuff and breaking down things instead of the simplicity. Jesus was simple and his gospel is simple. It's not what we have made it. It is totally something different. And someone asked me one time when I was on, you know, I've lectured all over the United States and in Germany and in England and in Scotland and in Ireland. I went to convents and lectured in convents to nuns. I lectured to priests all, all, everywhere. And you know what? They loved it. They loved it. They didn't jump on me. You know where I got trouble? From Protestants. From Protestants is where I got the trouble. Fundamentalists. They did all kinds of things. In fact, when I was in one place in uh, Ireland, they began to attack me, the Protestant people who came to hear me when I brought out some of these things in Aramaic, that there's no hell. Hell is an Aramaic expression of speech, which means mental torment and regret, not a place where God is roasting people. <laughs> and a Catholic priest stood up and defended me. <laughs> this is in Ireland. Hmm? And it was amazing. <laughs> this this is when I was lecturing a lot in Ireland. I've lectured all, all over. And in Europe, all kinds of things, too. And I, I understand why people got uh, would get upset at me. Because they've been taught another gospel. And not the simple gospel of Jesus. They've been taught another gospel. And that's why they get angry. That's why they want to throw things at me and all kinds of things. It's because of that. They've been brought up another way. And they're not open. They're closed. And which is okay. Jesus said, just shake the dust off your feet. And go on to the next house. Go to those who will receive you. And that's what I've been doing for years. And that's what Lambs had been doing for years too. So I wanted to give you that simple message of the sons of God. Now I have some questions. I see some questions are written here. But um, let me uh, let me go to just this one question that was sent in. This should take just but a few minutes to do, and then I'll get to your questions that you are sending in to me. I can see now I have three of them there. Let me give you this one. Okay. Uh, the Ten Commandments begins each with, Thou shalt not. Then they mention a person's name, and I don't want to mention the person's name, translates it as, thou need not. 
It's pretty good. I'd like to do that too. I'd like to fool around with scriptures and change it like that. <laughs> I don't want to tell you who this person and who, not the one who asked the question, but where they, where they said they're quoting the way they translate it. That's not a translation. I'm sorry. That's not a translation. What they told you, you need not kill. You need not commit adultery. You need not. That's not a translation. I'm sorry. It's not from Hebrew or Aramaic. It's only two words in Aramaic and in Hebrew. Just two. One is la. La. The word la means no. That's how you say no in Aramaic. La la means no, no. La. L-A. La. And then the verb. Whatever the verb may be. That's it. No, no, literally, no, kill, no, steal, no, adultery. <laughs> in fact, I'll never forget one time when I was lecturing in Michigan and uh, I was at a unity church and the people wanted to know, was one of the commandments mistranslated? Any of the mis any mistranslations in the commandments? And I said, I'm sorry to tell you, no, they weren't mistranslated. And and I said, and I know which one you're thinking about. And then they looked at me and I said, you're thinking about the one about adultery. <laughs> and they said, yes, that's the one I'm thinking about. In other words, can you give us a different meaning on that? <laughs> and I laughed. I laughed. I said, oh, yes. Because it's, thou shalt not commit adultery. Okay. I said, yes, it's very different in Aramaic. It says, no adultery. <laughs> but to be very, very literal, the verb is in that imperfect form, which can either be future tense or present tense, depending on how you want to word it. But the word need, you need not kill, you need not kill. Of course, we don't need to do those things, and we don't. I like what that person said, but I cannot say that that's a translation. That is not a translation in Hebrew or Aramaic. So, but uh, and they asked, this person asked me, uh, his translation changed everything for me. <laughs> well, I'm glad he did. I'm glad that that helped you. You need not kill. You need that's right. You don't need to, but people do it anyway. But and you need not commit adultery, but people do that anyway too. So <laughs> I'm glad it helped you. I'm not against that, but that's not what it says. And I cannot translate it any other way except no kill or don't kill. Don't uh steal. Don't I can do it that way too. But the word need is not that there's no other word there. It's strictly no and the verb. That's it. That's it in Hebrew and Aramaic. So that's it's a, it's a nice way to, you need not commit adultery. Yes, you don't need to commit adultery. You don't need to do those things. Pretty good. But sorry, the Bible doesn't say that. Okay. Second question. Did Jesus really say, no greater love hath man than to to die for his fellow man. Well, first of all, that's not exactly the quote from Jesus. That's found in the 15th chapter of the Gospel of John and the 13th verse. Let's go to 15, 13. I'll read it. This is Dr. Lambs's translation, okay? 15, 13. But let's read the verse before it because that helps when you're reading when you're reading it. Read all the verses that come before and after, just like people love to quote from the Gospel of John, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They love it. They love that one, but they don't want to read the verse before it. <laughs> because everyone who quotes that is talking about their own truth, what they want known. <laughs> but Jesus wasn't even saying that. You have to read the verse before it. Jesus says, he who persists or abides in my word or teaching, either way you want to translate that, in my word, you will know the truth. But it comes from a result of abiding in Jesus' teachings. 
persisting in it, understanding it. And I also may translate it, you, you know the truth, not you will know the truth. You persist in, in being my disciple in my word, then you know the truth and that very truth sets you free. I can translate it either in the sense of will set you free or sets you free. <laughs> it depends. If you're really abiding in the word, then you know the simple word and it's clearing. But we all love to quote that one. It's the same thing with this one. So he goes on to say in the 15th verse, first, first he said in the 12th verse, I'm sorry. Uh, after I read the one ab uh, above it, where he says, this is my commandment that you love one another. This is this is the 12th verse. This is my commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you. So his theme is love. His idea is talking about he knows he's going to be taken from them. And he wants them to really open up with love for each other. Hmm? Talking about his disciples. Really love for each other. Then he's going to show you something about love. Then he goes on to say in the 13th verse, there is no greater love than this. And this is how it's exactly written in English. There is no greater love than this. Okay. What is that greater love? No. What is it? That a man... Or I can translate it that anyone, not just man, that anyone, because in the East, they use the masculine form all the time. That a man lay down his life for the sake of his friends. And the question was, no greater love hath man than to die for his fellow man. It doesn't say that. It says, no greater love than this, that a man should lay down his life for his friends. And then the, the question is, what are these words really pointing to? Okay, you want to know what it's pointing to? That's exactly what I'm going to tell you. What it's pointing to, and it says it right in the scriptures. I don't even have to explain it. There is no greater love than this, that a, anyone, that a man or anyone lay down his life for the sake of his friends. The next verse, got to follow that next verse. The verse above, the verse below. What does he say? You are my friends. Speaking to his disciples. He didn't even call them stuff. He's calling them friends. Just like Abraham was a friend of God. He said, now you'll be my friends, not just my disciples, not just my students, but my friends. So what does he say? Who, what is Jesus saying? He proved his love by laying down his life for them. You want to know what he's getting at? This is exactly what he's getting at. You are my friends. What did he say? A man laid down his life for the sake of his friends? No greater love. You are my friends if you do everything that I told you or commanded you. Hmm? love one and he wanted them to love one another and to, and to, i love you all so much i'm going to give my life so to, what greater love can be proven than giving your 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 life laying down your life he says and he gave it willingly you have to read all the rest of the verses in the gospel of john people just don't keep it together they just they like to isolate verses and then build a some sort of strange doctrine or idea so keep it together the way it's done in the scripture. So that's what it means. All right, let me get to the questions that are written in for tonight. Uh, I have to go around this thing here. Okay, let me move it just slightly. All right, Robbie, can you clarify the metaphor of Acts 111? Let's see what's in Acts 111. Uh, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up to heaven jesus has ascended from you into heaven and shall come in like manner uh oh underscore that like manner underscore it 
shall come in like manner as you have seen him ascend into heaven. And how did they see him ascend into heaven? Spiritually. Spiritually. By revelation. They saw with spiritual eyes, not physical eyes. It looked to them as if it was physical, but it was spiritual. Just like I've saw Jesus appear to me when I was 16 years old, 16, age 16, appeared in the doorway of my bedroom. But I saw spiritually because it didn't stay. I saw, I saw Mariah and the feet did not touch the floor. It was like above floating. And I saw the full, he was dressed in this white garment, glowed, the face glowed and spoke to me. And I heard it with these ears. And told me what I needed to hear. And calmed me down. I was desperate. I was desperate. And I heard that. And that's what it means. When it says. Jesus had ascended from you into heaven. So shall he like manner. As you have seen him ascend into heaven. In other words. The, the real coming of Jesus. Is always spiritual. Always spiritual. Always. And you have to see with spiritual eyes. If you don't have spiritual eyes, you'll see nothing. You'll hear nothing. You'll know nothing. Okay? That's the meaning of it. In like manner. So what was the manner in which he ascended? Spiritually. No physical body could go up. A cloud cannot even hold a pin. A teeny little pin. Put it on a cloud. You think it's going to hold it? Wouldn't hold a physical body. Uh-uh. But a spiritual body, it will. Because you don't realize the spiritual body is just as real as the physical body. But you don't see it because it's veiled. It's veiled. Okay? All right. Th that answers that question. Is it not true that we were spirit before we came into flesh? Yes. And spirit is freed from the limitations of the flesh, body, when the body dies, yes. If that's true, then it is humanity that limits spirit and death of the flesh frees the spirit. And also, if you subdue the flesh, you free the spirit. Subdue it. I don't mean beat it. I don't mean do stuff like that. God doesn't expect us to do that. Subdue it. Paul talks about this in the 8th chapter of Romans that I was reading to you. He, says, now we, he talks about we're in the flesh, but follow after the spirit of Jesus. All right, I didn't do that scripture tonight, uh, tonight because I didn't want to get into the, the details, but your question's making me get into it. Good. Let's go to Romans, the 8th chapter where I was speaking from tonight about the sons of God. And I love the way Dr. Lambda translates it. Romans, the eighth chapter. Let me go to it. The way my teacher translates it. There is therefore no condemnation to them who walk in the flesh. Huh? Who walk in the flesh. Yeah, exactly what you brought up here. Who walk in the flesh after the spirit of Jesus, the anointed. In other words, we're in the flesh but we're following after the spirit that is in Jesus, okay? For the law of the spirit of life, which is in Jesus the anointed, has made you free from the law of sin and death because you're, you're following the spirit now. You're following the influence of God now. So the flesh then does not completely veil everything. That's, that's what it says here. That's what you're asking. It limits it. But when you limit the flesh, then spirit comes forth. You got it? If you go on to read that, he goes on to, he talks more and more about it. Those who are led by the spirit in the 14th verse of God are the sons of God, even though you're in the flesh. Because he talks about it, we're in the flesh. For you have not received the spirit of bondage to be in fear, which the flesh has always done. <clears throat> Again, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, 
Awun, Abba Awun, which is Abba Father, or Awa Father, Awun, our Father. So Lamza puts the Aramaic and the English in there. And the Spirit hears wit bears witness to our spirit that we are the sons of God. Lamza translates that as children, but it's the same word there. Sons of God. And if we're sons of God, then we're heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Jesus, the Messiah, the anointed one. Don't you love that? We Now, as sons of God, we are one with God, and we are heirs of God, and joint heirs with Jesus of Nazareth, because he was the first son to manifest. And now we are manifesting our sonship. Hmm? So we're joint heirs with him. I love it the way it's put here. It's not preached that way. I'm telling you, even though it's written very clearly and very plainly. But because of old teachings and doctrines, it kind of blinds us. All right. Let's get to the last question here. Can we say the chief shepherd is our milta? If you want to say that, that's fine. I see nothing wrong with that. He is your chief shepherd. If you're a minister and you are shepherding people, then Jesus is your chief shepherd. In other words, he's our guide. His teachings guide us. We abide in his teachings. We persist in his teachings. He is our chief shepherd. But in the psalm, when it says the Lord shepherds me, that's when the Lord God itself becomes the chief shepherd in the 23rd Psalm, who shepherds me, nourishes me, guides me, all that. That's all what that means there in the Psalm. Beautiful. And that concludes our session for this evening. Now, next Wednesday, I'm speaking next Wednesday also. In fact, I'm, I'm taking up every Wednesday for this entire month <clears throat> until Annie gets back. So I will be doing that until from, well until the month of June, the first Wednesday in June will be Reverend Hanny, but I, it'll be me until the end of June, every Wednesday. So, and I'm finished. I don't think I'll be doing any more on the Sonship. I don't know exactly what I'll be doing next Wednesday, not yet. So uh, until then, God bless you and thank you for your contributions and help to keep us going on these sessions here. I appreciate it very much. You know, we don't charge for this. It's, it's up to you from your own free will offering. Just send it into the foundation. It's tax deductible. It's if you write it to the Nucra Foundation and therefore it will be used that, to keep everything going here. We appreciate it so much. Bless you. Thank you. And I'll see you next Wednesday. Bye for now.